Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. May peace be upon him. May peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad removed the dust. Remove the dust of unbelief. Prophet Muhammad brought us, brought us a good relief. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. May peace be upon him. May peace. Alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah and blessings and peace be on the Messenger of Allah. Brothers and sisters, welcome back to another episode of this series, More Than Honey and Black Seed. It's a series on the prophetic medicine, At-Tabb al nabawi or the Prophet's medicine, At-Tabb al nabawi And it's a series that aims to broaden our uh, understanding of what At-Tabb al nabawi is, the guidance that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, came with uh, that, that helps in the preservation and promotion of human health is uh, far more than just a few applications that many of us associate with Tabbun Nabi, such as uh, honey and black seed and so on and so forth. Uh, we have covered uh, faith and how faith impacts, and certainly we briefly uh, you know, cover those uh, areas. Uh, because we can't do justice to those areas in this brief time. But we've covered uh, how faith impacts the, the health positively, and it's not only the spiritual health that we're talking about, it's also the emotional health, it's also the mental health, and it is also the physical uh, health that, that, that we're addressing here. And we, we've talked about uh, the Khisal uh, al-Fitra, which are the characteristics uh, of, of al-Fitra, genuine inclination, natural way uh, for humanity. We've talked also about the benefits of the acts of wudu. Uh, we started the acts of worship at Ibadat, and we've talked about uh, the, the various uh, benefits that uh, uh, are there in the chapters, uh, in all of the chapters of purification. We started even from the rulings of water. And we talked about how the Islam aims to fight obsessions and aims to counter uh, our tendency to obsess about certain acts of worship like purification and salat. We, we've talked about removing of impurities and we uh, talked about wudu and now we will briefly talk about ghusl before we start our talk about uh, the prayers. But before we talk about the prayers and before we talk about ghusl, let me just uh, remind you of a few things that we should really keep in mind uh, throughout this series. Uh, of those things, uh, number one, uh, when we talk about those issues, this is not just a, a matter of theory uh, that is completely dissociated from our spiritual uh, growth. This, we learn this so that we spiritually grow. We learn this so that we can develop more recognition for the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more recognition for the greatness of this religion, more recognition for the, the prophets, role, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in conveying all of this good to us, and more recognition will mean more, more love, certainly. It's, it's, a, it's an inevitable consequence of, the, of more recognition, to have more love uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It varies with people. You can have more recognition and less love with people, but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more recognition will automatically mean more love. So... This is a matter that that uh, that should be uh, should be received not only by our minds but also by but uh, by our hearts. Uh, and the other issue that I wanted to say is that the inimitability of this guidance, uh, the, the miracle of this guidance, the inimitability of this guidance does not pertain to single pieces of. Uh, advice that the Prophet ﷺ had given us with regard to this issue or that issue because oftentimes those pieces of advice can be arrived at uh, via the human intellect uh, but, but it is in the collectivity of it. It is in the, the, the fact that there, all of this guidance, all of this guidance comes without mistakes and that's the most important part and we should be able to defend any of the uh, uh, advice, uh, piece of advice in the revelation regarding health, whether it's in the Quran or the authentic sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, there should be no difficulty with this at all. Remember, we talked about female circumcision 
uh, before we talked about the, the hadith of the fly uh, that, that falls in the vessel of, uh, and, 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 and it is to be dipped or say, you know, sunk uh, into the, the liquid before it's taken out. We talked about those issues and we showed how science actually gives some pretext for uh, such advice. Uh, so the inimitability is in the collective guidance and the fact that there are no mistakes uh, with this huge amount of uh, guidance in all areas, in all regards, and in all aspects. Uh, we also need to remember one thing, which is uh, the, the question that may arise in some of, uh, some of my, the minds of some people uh, is why are Muslims not healthier than if you have all of this guidance? There are many things that we have, we, we, you know, we have to consider. One of, a, one of those things uh, would be the fact that Muslims are not always practicing. Muslims are not always practicing. Muslims are not always following the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. So that's has, that, that has to be remembered. That has to be remembered. And the other thing also is that the Muslims who live in, in, uh, you know, in a certain environment like uh, war-torn or poverty-stricken environment should not be compared with non-Muslims who live uh, you know, in Scandinavia. Uh, that would be unfair. We have to correct for the variables. We have to stabilize the confounding factors and variables before we talk about the, the, comp you know, the comparison and the significance of the comparison. Uh, but I would uh, certainly say that if Muslims uh, apply Islam, apply Islam, uh, they will fare better in terms of health than their counterparts who live in the same environment. Uh, take, for instance, the pr prevalence of HIV in, within uh, South African Muslims versus South African uh, non-Muslims. Uh, certainly, that the rates uh, or the incidence of the infection is less. And, and, and the Muslim population. So that also needs to be uh, remembered. Also, we have to remember that when we talk about the wisdom, you know, the, the, when we talk about some of the wisdom behind the prayers, behind fasting, behind this or that, we're talking about only uh, the wisdom that pertains to health. And even as human beings, if we try to sort of enlist everything we know about the wisdom behind a certain legislation, we will not encompass the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're only looking at what we can see to strengthen, to strengthen our faith, to increase our certainty. But we, as Muslims, submitters, that's, that's what the word Islam means. It means submitters. We as submitters, as Muslims, submit to the revelation, the Qur'an and the authentic sunnah, uh, whether or not we understand the, 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 bag, you know, the, 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 the premise upon which uh, the obligation was made or, or the pro prohibition. Uh, and now let's move right into bathing. Bathing is, uh, is obligatory in Islam in certain uh, in, you know, circumstances or conditions, and it is recommended in others. Uh, th this is so beautiful because the the, the idea of, of a, uh, sort of making bathing obligatory, uh, some people may say, you know, what does a religion have to do with the issue, issue of bathing? This is just personal hygiene. This is a personal matter. Uh, it doesn't have much to do with the religion. No, the religion comes for our well-being, our well-being in this life. Uh, not the hereafter, because of the hereafter we will be uh, acting properly, spontaneously, without you know any effort. But in this life, our the religion prescribes everything that is good for our well-being, our individual and collective uh, well-being as human beings and as societies. So bathing is mandatory in Islam after uh, intercourse. Bathing is mandatory in Islam after. Uh, ejaculation, bathing is mandatory in Islam uh, after the menstrual period, after the, the, the cessation of postnatal bleeding. It is mandatory after all of this. Bathing uh, is also, according to some of the scholars, mandatory if you, if you, if, uh, if you need it, like if you, if you have some uh, unpleasant odor and you will go to Al-Jamu'ah, for instance, to pray, the Jumu'ah prayer, 
uh, then bathing would be mandatory according to some of the scholars, uh, including Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him and them all. So that is mandatory bathing. And it is mandatory on us also to, to, to give a ritual bath to the deceased, the dead. Um, bathing would be recommended for gatherings, uh, the Eid prayer, the Eclipse prayer, uh, uh, Arafah, the stoning the Jamarat, uh, all of those gatherings, uh, bathing would be recommended when you, uh, you, you, your condition changes, whether it is mental, your, your mental condition, you've, you've become unconscious, and, and so on, or it is your physical condition, bathing would be recommended there as well. And according to some controversial hadith that some of the scholars acted upon, bathing would be recommended for someone who gave a ritual bath to some uh, to the deceased or the the, the dead, uh, and the, the hadith may be weak, but uh, you know the scholars, uh, many scholars act upon it. The idea here is that bathing is recommended in so many circumstances for us Muslims, and it is obligatory in some. Now, uh, the the time online, the times online, times online. Uh, in, in an article that was published on March, 20th, March 26th of uh, 2009, they said that in the year 1000, in the year 1000, uh, the Crusaders returned from the East with the news of a delightful custom. The Crusaders returned from the East with the news of a delightful custom, the Turkish bath. Bath houses are built all over uh, Europe. Bath houses are built all, all over Europe. It is it is known from the history that the Crusaders uh, did actually take a lot of those uh, hygienic practices from uh, their mixing with the Muslims uh, during during the Crusades, and they took the, those back to Europe. Now, this is not to be chauvinistic. Absolutely, we have to understand that. Uh, Unfortunately, sometimes when you make a comparison between the conditions of the Muslims now and the conditions of the non-Muslims, like not necessarily the non-Muslims all over the place. We're talking about the non-Muslims maybe in Europe. If you make a comparison between the, 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 the conditions of our streets, uh, public bath, uh, public uh, lavatories or uh, streets or this or that, the cleanliness of the, our institutions, our buildings, uh, the, 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 the comparison will not be in our favor in most of the Muslim countries, not necessarily all of the Muslim countries, because in some of the Muslim countries, conditions may be different. But in most, most of the Muslim countries, the, the comparison will not be in our favor. That has not uh, anything to do, it doesn't have anything to do with Islam. It, you know, Islam actually enjoins uh, you know, cleanliness. Islam enjoins purification. Uh, Islam or enjoys organization and, and so on and so forth. That is our failure. Uh, that's our personal failure and our collective failure to uphold uh, those uh, Islamic uh, values, those, those great Islamic values. So it is, not, uh, it is not imprudent that we look at others and we uh, benefit from what they do because that is, after all, what Islam enjoins uh, on us. And uh, so uh, there, there's got to be some reconsideration of our conditions and we have to realign ourselves with the guidance of Islam. When we come back after the break, we'll talk about the benefits of the prayers, inshallah, God willing. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Inshallah, on the straight path, we would like to discuss the niqab from an Islamic and social political perspective. So sometimes some non-Muslims, they might not understand the full Islamic pictures. Anyone can say anything about it. Yes. So when can we, who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. This is the biggest question. <laughs> who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. No, they are not sinning. They are not sinning, but we are talking about now the general ruling. Mm -hmm. They are not sinning but they are going against what has been established. It is his own ishtihad at a specific time. People would see it as a threat. A threat. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we explain to them it's not really a threat? It's as actually good for the country as well. But if we don't participate, how would we ever reach to our rights? Can you clarify with us what should be the level of political participation of the Muslims in the West? Yeah. Oh. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Alhamdulillah. Welcome back. Uh, we said we will talk about the benefits of prayers, and certainly there are so many benefits uh, for the prayers. We'll talk about some of them, inshallah. Uh, one of the benefits of prayers, let's start with Rukua. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to, to bow with those who bow. Uh, so, وَرْكَعُوا مَعَ الرَّكَعِينَ And bow with those who bow. So, uh, bowing ha has a lot of benefits. According to an article in the, in the Journal of Chiropractic uh, that was published in 1984, flexing your hip, flexing your hip. And if you look at the screen, you will find that the, the, flexing, uh, of the flexing of the hip uh, 90 degrees will actually have benefits for the spinal cord. It will decrease the amount of pressure on the, uh, the vertebrae the, the, uh, or the vertebral column and will decrease the, tr the, the traction and it will help negate some of the uh, uh, effects of gravity on the, on the vertebral column and the spinal cord. Uh, inversion does this. Uh, so, the, this is just one of the benefits of uh, b bowing. The beautiful thing is that when you read how the Prophet ﷺ used to bow, the Prophet ﷺ used to bow, you know, and make his, his back completely flat, make his back completely flat. Uh, so, if you really adhere to the sunnah, that's the other benefit also. If you really adhere to the sunnah, you reap the whole benefit of your prayers. So try to perform your prayers. Certainly you adhere to the sunnah so that you are more aligned with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But as a secondary gain, as a secondary gain, uh, you will reap all the benefits of the prayer if you adhere to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So uh, 90 degrees to make like a right angle between your thighs and your uh, trunk is is actually most beneficial when you bow, and that's exactly how the Prophet ﷺ used to bow. And if you look at the screen now, you will see uh, one of the benefits of sujood. Uh, this is a this is called an inversion table. The inversion table aims to bring your head at a level lower than your heart, so your head will be actually uh, below, and your feet will be above. The, so you 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 pretty much bring your head at a level that is lower than your heart. Uh, some of the benefits of the inversion table is that certain crevices in the brain, certain uh, areas in the brain or crevices of the brain do not get enough blood supply, do not get enough blood supply when you're standing, when you're sitting. Be why? Because your head is higher than the level of your heart. When you're sitting like this, your head is higher than uh, the level of your heart. What, what if you're sleeping? When do human beings anyway, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring their heads, when do human beings bring their heads lower than the level of their hearts? Do they ever do this? If you do not pray, and if you do not do the, actually the Muslim prayer, where you prostrate, if you do not pray and do that prayer with prostration, you will never bring your head lower than your heart unless you have, you know, you do those acrobatic games and you stand on your uh, head and, and so on and so forth. But for the majority of people, they don't do that. Even when you go to sleep, your head is not going to be lower than the level of your heart. Your head is going to be, uh, if you have a pillow, it may be above. If you don't have a pillow, it may be, you know, at the same level as uh, your heart. However, when you prostrate, you bring your head at a level lower than your heart. What's the benefit? Then the blood will, more blood will get to those crevices in the brain and irrigate them. And that uh, is helpful 
uh, for, for the nutrition of the brain or those crevices or those areas of the, br the brain that are somewhat, somewhat uh, deprived of blood supply when uh, you're standing or uh, sitting. So prostration does have uh, this uh, benefit. Uh, all of the, you know, we, we talked about bowing and prostration, but all of the movements of the prayer uh, have benefits. And in a study that was done in Japan, uh, the Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan, and I, I hope I am not massacring the name, but the Hokkaido University in, in Sapporo, Japan, there was a study done there on the Salah, you know, not any pray, other prayer, on the Islamic prayer, the Salat. And in this study, the conclusion was physical activities involved in the performance of Salat would help in the rehabilitation process in disabled geriatric patients. The physical activities that are involved in the Salat, why? Because they are consistent, they are repetitive, and they are mild. They are consistent, they are repetitive, and they are mild. So they would be of help in rehabilitating geriatric patients uh, because, of, because of those qualities. Uh, yoga is quite common. It's quite popular, particularly in the West now. More and more people are interested in yoga. Uh, yoga does have uh, the so-called chakra points, the seven chakra points. According to Dr. Karima Bruns, uh, th those chakra points of yoga are all activated in the salah, in, in, in the prayer. And she even goes farther to say that the salah would provide more benefits uh, than the yoga. Now, certainly keep in mind, this is not like a well-done, standardized study proving this. This is the so-called expert opinion. And expert opinion is a weaker evidence. So we have, to, we have to keep this in mind. The expert opinion is, is a weaker evidence. It comes at the bottom of, uh, of the, the, the hierarchy uh, of evidences. But, but you just keep, keep this in mind uh, so that you're aware. However, this expert opinion, when it is based on some uh, logical uh, pretext, then it is worth mentioning as well. Now, if you want to put it all together, if you want to put it all together, according to the Benson Henry Institute for the Mind Body uh, Medicine, that is a, a Harvard uh, University Institute, uh, the, the, the Benson Henry Institute, according to that institute, elicitation of the relaxation response is actually quite easy and it requires two essential steps. The first step they talk about it. The first step, that is the elicitation of the relaxation response, the first step is repetition of a word, sound, phrase, prayer, or muscular activity. Repetition of words, sounds, phrases, prayers, or muscular activities. Which salah in the entire world, in which religion, does the salah contain all of that? Repetition of words, phrases, sounds, and muscular prayers and muscular activities with, with complete disregard of any intense uh, thoughts. That is only in the Islamic Salah. If you look at the screen quickly, you will find that in the Islamic Salah, there, is, there are muscular activities, there are uh, there is repetition of words, repetition of prayers, you're involved mentally, you're involved spiritually, and those prayers are obligatory on men and women, and those prayers are frequent. Five times a day uh, do we uh, pray. So that puts it all together, and th that tells us the, you know, that, that the prayers are not only good, for our connection with Allah, which is the greatest thing. But there are also other benefits for our minds, for, for our relaxation, for our spirituality, for, our, for the ease of you know, uh, our minds, and, and so on and so forth. So pray, but pray right. That is important. To reap those benefits, you have to pray properly. It is quite important. Inshallah, in the next episode, 
We'll talk more about the congregation prayers, and then we'll go over zakat and hajj. Until I see you then, enjoy the favors and blessings of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. Prophet Muhammad brought the light. Prophet Muhammad enlightened the sight. May peace be upon him. May peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad removed the dust. Removed the dust of unbelief. Prophet Muhammad brought us. Brought us a good relief. May peace be upon him. May peace be upon